Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, interesting week, a great week. Uh, you may uh, have seen last week that I had an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle about the importance of, of vaccines and how it's, how it's helped man live longer, uh, man and women live longer. And uh, I got a great letter to the editor from Carl Sagan's sister saying she enjoyed that. And of course, I had to tell my sister that Carl Sagan's sister uh, said something very positive. And so my sister said, behind every successful scientist is a brilliant sister. I mean, come on. Anyway, so apparently that was true for Carl Sagan. I don't even put myself in his category, but my sister's claiming all credit for anything I'm, I'm doing. So if I'd screw it up, Janet, it's your fault. Anyway, uh, things are looking good. I mean, I, I hate to say it. <laughs> uh, I, I saw a thing that was talking about press coverage, and apparently 90% of all press coverage is bad news for the coronavirus. So, uh, and I, that, that rings true, actually. I think that's probably true. So I'm just going to talk about good news. <laughs> Spring break. <laughs> what good news is it? I mean, holy goodness. Uh, I don't know if you saw the pictures of Miami, but what are they doing down there? I don't know. Anyway, there is some good news. Uh, we continue to go down in the number of cases. We've been having about 30,000 cases a day now for a while. So it's not, it's not getting better, just sort of chugging along there. Some big outbreaks in the, in the Northeast and Michigan. So that ain't looking so good. The Northeast and Michigan, New Jersey's almost back to where it was in the beginning. So that's not good. Uh, and I don't know what, why New Jersey is bad, but I, I try to stay away from New Jersey anyway. The good news is we're up to two and a half million people getting vaccinated every day. So that is really, that is great news. Remember, just a month ago, we were lucky to get a million people. So two and a half million is fantastic. The problem is, and I'm not going to call this bad news, just the problem, because I'm in the good news mode. Our, our decline has not gone down as much as we wanted to. If you'll recall, last week I was worried that we might have a little mini surge, and I'm still a little worried because of spring break. Uh, those, those crazy kids, uh, they're going to be spreading virus all over the place, so I anticipate we will get a little bit of a bump in a week. But it's, it looks like we're re really in a race uh, to get, you know, get it down. Uh, Eric Borwinkel, who's the dean of the UT Public Health School, had a real interesting prevalence study. And what it showed, what it showed so far is that in the people over age of 50, the prevalence of, of, the, of the disease is only about 10%, whereas between 20 and 30, it's closer to 40%. That gives you the general 30% overall. Which means that once you hit about 50, you're, you know, you've learned to get out of the rain. You're smart enough to not screw up. Well, the 20-year-olds, they're, they're, oh my God. Anyway, that's the big problem. So as I said, I think last week, just vaccinate them all. Before you get on the beach, give, vaccinate them. They shouldn't be allowed to go into a bar without a vaccination. Anyway, if you look at where we're, the projections uh, look like, we're, we're not quite as bad as that hump that we originally talked about, but we're sort of in between it's not it going down the way we want it to go down, but I think we, will, we may escape the problem if we get enough people vaccinated. And the national vaccination date is actually really good. We've, we've gotten 83 million people who've had at least one dose. So that's 25% of the population. Now, remember, 30% has probably already gotten the disease, 25% vaccinated. So we're getting there. We're getting towards that, that magic 65 to 70%. And if you look at the percentage of people over the age of 65 who've been vaccinated is 70 percent. So we've done a great job of getting the vulnerable uh, population uh, vaccinated. So that's, that's all very, very good. Now, if we could just get 20-year-olds to behave normally, wouldn't the world be a better place? Uh, it's interesting, the distribution of the vaccine has been kind of variable. The Southeast is lagging behind. Texas is lagging behind. I don't know why. I don't know why that's the case, but we are lagging behind other states in terms of getting vaccine. Uh, and if you look at the Texas map for cases, uh, there's this one dip. That was the famous uh, storm, the cold weather, where nobody went out for anything. So we didn't detect cases. But you can see it's trickling down. But it's persistently sticking there uh, that our number is at one. We just, 
for the last week or so, we just can't get it down to where it needs to be. You know, remember, above one, virus winning, below one, we're, we're conquering the virus. It's just always stuck right about 0.981, back and forth. And if you look at plot the R number over time, which Chris Amos did for me, it's interesting. You can see the tremendous impact on infectivity when you lock down. That was the lockdown. And then, of course, we had Memorial Day, another, another great intelligent behavior by, by kids. Uh, we had that giant spike, uh, and you could see the R number went up. And then it was falling down. It looked really, really good until the fall. And once again, we had that fall surge where the R stayed above one. Welcome to college and universities opening up. And the mask order was, was uh, stopped on March 10th, and we will see what goes on. I mean, it's, we're still persistently around one. And until we get it, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, we're gonna continue to see cases. And even, as I remind people, even when we hit herd immunity, there's still a lot of people who are available to be infected. If 65 or 70 percent of the people are protected, that's 30 percent who can still get infected. So we've got to do, uh, we've got to get, uh, do better. And, and the thing that you can see, it really shows in the rolling seven-day uh, seven average, it, we're just flat. We're just having cases that are, you know, in the thousand per day range. And we're going to have that all, all summer long. We don't want that. You remember, I want to go out to dinner. I want to go to a restaurant without a mask. But we can't do that if we have a bunch of cases in, in, in town. We're up to about over a million doses now of, uh, of administered doses of vaccine here in, in, um, in Texas, in the Texas Medical Center. So that's also very good. So that's how we stand for, for the, the virus in general and our vaccines. But let's talk about <laughs> AstraZeneca. I mean, what, how can you screw up a vaccine introduction more than AstraZeneca has done it. I mean, I, I, I just feel bad for them. I mean, we need it. Remember, it's cheaper than all the other vaccines. It's stored stably in six months in a refrigerator. You know, the rest of the world has to be vaccinated for us to get normal. And all of Europe, Europe is sort of depending upon AstraZeneca. But oh my Lord, what a bad rollout. And they keep making mistakes. I mean, they just keep screwing up. Uh, remember, the, the, the trial was halted uh, in Europe because there was one case or two cases of transverse myelitis, a neurologic complication. They figured out it wasn't related to the vaccine, then they started back up. Uh, and they have administered, you know, it was approved in Europe, and they've administered uh, over 17 million doses of vaccines. But there have been these 37, 38 cases of, of reports of clotting abnormalities. And, and because of that, one European country after another just stopped, you said we're going to suspend using um, the AstraZeneca vaccine. The European regulatory agency said, you know, it's safe. And so they all started back, except for Sweden. Sweden's not, Sweden's not going along with that. They're just, they're waiting. Uh, so uh, when you think about it, though, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was rolled out initially in, in uh, Europe, and, and the studies were done in South Africa and Brazil. But the U.S. wanted it done here. So we just had uh, 32,000 enrollees into a study, and the, it showed it was very effective. Unfortunately, AstraZeneca had a press release that announced they were 79% effective against mild disease, except that's not what the data showed. The data showed it was like 64 or 70% between that range. And so it immediately, you know, irritated the regulatory agencies here, and there was a, you know, kind of a little pissing match in the, in the press over that. That's not the way you get approval of, from the U.S. So the U.S. is, uh, I don't know what they're going to do. My guess is it'll get approved in the U.S., but, but who knows? I mean, who knows? And then, of course, there was just a paper. This came out in the New England Journal this week of uh, a study, a phase 1B, 2B study uh, in 750 p participants looking specifically in South Africa to the South African variant. And they had 750 people, uh, randomized, placebo-controlled. 19 of the people who got vaccinated got the disease, and 23 who had placebo got the disease. So it's only 10% effective against the B.1.351 South African variant. Now, everybody was mild, and no one was hospitalized. But it looks like the AstraZeneca vaccine is not very effective against the South African variant. We'll have to see in a larger trial. 
But, you know, that's not just the South. That's just not AstraZeneca. All of the vaccines have been developed for the original spike protein. So it's a big concern. Uh, and, you know, obviously we're going to have to start dealing with these variants. And they keep cropping up. And until we get the whole world vaccinated, we're going to continue to have multiple variants. So let's just talk a little bit about variants because they are becoming a big, big, big problem. So remember the original uh, uh, virus mutated early on. It was the D614G mutant. That be, that's the one that took over all of China and ended up in Europe and eventually the United States. And if you look at it, there's a bunch. This, this is a picture of the, the virus and this is the genome. And there's a bunch of, of uh, mutations. In fact, 17% of the entire virus has got now mutations in it. There's 30,000 building blocks of nucleotides and they make 29 proteins. But there are deletions and mutations all over, and the ones that are really concerning are the ones that are in the spike protein, that, that's that spike protein that binds to the receptor on the, uh, the cells and brings the virus in. And that uh, spike protein is actually made up of three proteins. It's, it's, a, it's a trimer, and it, it, it looks just like a spike, but it's got three proteins. And the, in that spike protein, there are now eight known mutations that are problematic. Uh, and the one that's probably uh, most uh, well studied is this N501 mutation that was originally described uh, in the United Kingdom. Now, I just want to say something about it. We call it the UK variant. We name these things based on where it was first found. But these, this particular mutation is found in many, many countries all over the world. And it probably didn't get on an airplane and go to each of those countries. This is what's called convergent evolution. As there's m many mistakes made, if there's a variation that actually is beneficial to the virus, it'll be selected for. The virus doesn't have a brain. It just makes mistakes uh, in, as it replicates. And if there's a mutation that makes it more effective, no matter where it happens in the world, that'll become selected for and there'll be more viruses. So this mutation keeps appearing in multiple different cu countries. And the 501 mutation is, a, it's a reason called N501. It's in the 501 position. N is asparagine. It's mutated to tyrosine. And that is right at the tip of the binding domain. And in the binding domain is the part that actually binds to the ACE2 receptor. And here is a picture of the binding domain going right up and grabbing that ACE2 receptor. That's how it gets into cells. Now, this mutation is in Australia, Brazil, Denmark, Japan, the Netherlands, South Africa, Illinois. It's in Illinois. It's, it's in Ohio and Texas. It's all over the place. So this is a good example of it, that mutation is being selected for because it, is, it clearly makes the, the virus more um, infective. And what it does is it binds more tightly to the ACE2 receptor, about 70% more tightly, and that then allows it to uh, uh, be more infective, about 50% more infective. Now, there are other mutations. There is a deletion mutation also. Now, deletion mutations are interesting because they tend to change the structure of the, of the protein. So you can imagine building blocks. If you take out a major building block, it might lean to the left or lean to the right. And that's what these deletion mutations do. And the deletion mutations tend to be on the arms. So you can see this on the two arms. That's where the, one of the major deletions is, the H6970 deletion. Now, why is that important? We, we tend to think in, you know, in chemical structures, but this is, they are 3D structures. These are three-dimensional structures, and your antibody recognizes the three dimensions. So it recognizes this globule, and if the arms are missing, or it moves, its elbows are slightly different, the antibody may not recognize it, and that is what's happening. The interesting thing about this deletion is this coronavirus also infects minks. So for all of those people who like mink coats, millions of minks are infected with this particular deletion mutant. And why is that important? Well, we don't know. But the reason we need to keep sequencing it is in the future, these may become important mutations and we need to know what they are so we can design uh, ever improving vaccines. There's also a deletion mutant in the same kind of uh, area, also on the arms, the elbows, and it, it's similarly thought to evade uh, immune surveillance. So where are these things cropping up? Well, the UK variant is all over the place in the US, and it's actually thought to be now about 50% of all the transmissible viruses um, 
uh, in the United States. And it's, it's, it's really getting to be the dominant uh, uh, virus. So when, when we start thinking about what, is all this, what does all this mean? Well, it means we're going to have to have another vaccine. I mean, there's no question about it. There's going to have to be a second generation of vaccine to these new uh, mutations. Uh, there's still a chance we can get a pan-coronavirus vaccine. In other words, something that, it, you know, I, we talked about a few months ago, there's a particular antibody that recognizes a part of the virus that's not the spike protein, but is really important for getting into cells. That could be a target, but we need a lot of research on sequencing all these so we know all the variations, and we need a lot of research on developing the second generation of, of um, vaccines who can deal with the various mutations. My guess is we will all need a booster shot coming up in the next you know, year or so based on the, the, the uh, various mutations. So one last thing I wanted to leave you with is, you know, it is really kind of amazing uh, what the impact has been uh, on mortality. And this is a, a graph. You can see declining mortality as man lives longer and longer. Well, that was the Spanish flu, and this is the impact of coronavirus. So it's, it's had a huge impact, and as I mentioned, human beings lost on average one year of life this year because of the COVID uh, experience. So listen, as we wrap up uh, today the spring holidays are coming up not not, not just spring break but spring uh, religious holidays a lot of people are going to be wanting to gather please remember we're still in the middle of a pandemic until we hit the number we need which is close to 65 or 70 percent of the population vaccinated and frankly we need the world vaccinated uh, we're going to have to continue to be social distancing and wearing masks so be thoughtful. Don't have a hundred people show up in your house. Small gatherings of your nuclear family and people who've been vaccinated, that's perfectly fine. But don't, uh, don't give up yet. We still have a couple of months of, uh, of, of headway yet to go. So have a great week. I look forward to seeing you next week for another renewal of our, our second season of, of uh, video. So see you next week.